Grace to you and peace from God the Father, the Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ. About 15 years ago, a Lutheran writer, theologian, and teacher by the name of Martin Marty wrote a letter to the president of Harvard University. It seems there was a scandal going on at Harvard, and he felt he wanted to weigh into it. What had happened was is that uh, the president of Harvard had declined to renew the contracts of two, let's say, middle-aged scholars. They were in their mid-50s. I say middle-aged now because, well, that's where I'm at. Actually, I'm <laughs> past that a few years. but. Uh, and uh, the president of Harvard had decided that they were kind of past the age, past their prime, uh, that they would no longer be able to kind of put the Harvard uh, front face on that they wanted to have, and so they, they didn't renew their contracts. Now, Marty's letter was not only prompted by the fact that this was, you know, he thought grossly unfair, but also by the fact that he himself had just turned 74 that same week. So without being unkind or even a little bit defensive, he acknowledged that while he was fully 20 years older than both of these men that the uh, president considered past their prime, he didn't believe for a moment that he was past his prime. He gently reminded the president of Harvard that uh, Franz Liszt performed at Luxembourg at age 74, that Angelo Giuseppe Rancelli became Pope John XXIII at age 76, George Byrne won his first and only Oscar at the age of 80, Benjamin Franklin helped to frame the Constitution of the United States at the age of 81. This man, uh, Gucci, uh, at the age of 88, finished writing Faust. And this man, Winston Churchill, started writing his history of the English-speaking people, also at age 88. Albert Schweitzer was still a practicing physician at the age of 89, and Pablo Picasso was still cranking out masterpieces at the age of 90. You catch my drift, Marty wrote, <laughs> whose own schedule that year was completely full every day, every week, with travel and lectures and consulting and teaching and writing. Martin Marty turned 89 last month, 89. And he still has a full schedule of lectures and he writes and is still considered one of the finest uh, religious minds of our day. But this story serves to remind us uh, kind of as an introductory comment, I should say, to this tiny little vignette that is buried in our Old Testament lesson this morning, and I wonder if you might have missed it. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, go to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And then you skip all that, you get to the end, and goes, so he went, and Abram was 75 years old when he left from Haran. That little detail about Abram's age preserved in the ancient text, I think, for a reason. Because even 3,000 years ago, 75 was not that the age you normally packed up your bags and moved to a strange place and started your life over. Even back then at 75, people expected you to act your age. In Abram's nomadic world, it was a singular goal to accumulate enough cattle, enough property, enough wealth to make a nomadic existence unnecessary. The whole definition of success in Abraham's world was to get enough money and property and, and wealth to not have to live like a nomad, to not have to move from one place to the other. The whole defini definition of success was to get to that time and place in your life when you never have to move and never have to change. And the story that you heard today is about two people, Abram and Sarai, who have arrived and have achieved everything that their life goals were set out to achieve. They have stability, they have wealth, they have status and property, even by the standards of our day and age. They have it made. Then along comes this disembodied voice that commands them to get up, move. Without even giving them a clear idea of where it is they're going, get up, move. They just hear the voice that promises them a land and someday that they'll be the progenitors of a great nation, which was no small promise to make since Abraham was 75, Sarai was, who knows, about the same age, and they had no children. The biology wasn't even working in their favor. It was just the two of them and this voice calling them into an unknown, unforeseeable, frightening future. And that call was not just about new geography. It was about everything being new. This God of the desert invites them to embrace the newness, to go where, well, I would say no man or woman has gone before. To depart every familiar landmark to just walk away from kith and kin, from everything they valued, everything they cherished. And a thousand years after this took place, a man named Paul, when he was trying to explain to a bunch of newbie Christians what faith was like, 
He didn't point to King David. He didn't point to the prophet Isaiah. He pointed to these two old codgers, Abram and Sarai, and he wrote, Abram believed God, and his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, in these, day, these days, when we think of faith at all, we are apt to think of it as being about what we can know, what we can bring ourselves to believe. Faith, to most of us, is an intellectual proposition. It comes after much rumination and study, and then more rumination, and the weighing of truths and past experiences. When we use the phrase, leap of faith, we don't mean it to be an expression of confidence or of courage. It is rather a description of something unrealistic or stupid. We think of faith as the capacity to figure out that something out there has the power and persuasiveness to overcome something in here. We seem to not read our Bibles very carefully anymore. Because along comes this story you just heard, and it's about faith, and not just any faith, but a faith that leads to righteousness. The faith of two elderly people who have, by this world's standards, overcome every obstacle already and deserve to retire, to walk away from what they're doing, to not have to take any risks. And I've heard it many times from some of you. We've got a certain age, and we think it's time for someone else to take the lead, someone else to endure the risk, someone else to bear the load. How would you hear and accept this invitation from God? I think this invitation has to be made to a people who are, as one scholar put it, habitually restless. A people who are ready to dare and willing to trust in the promises of the one who calls them. I think that faith, at least according to this story, is the capacity to risk what you have for what might be given. It's not about what you know. It's about whom you know. It's a faith that leads to righteousness. And let's be honest. It's a very def a different definition of what we mean when we use the words faithful and righteous. We think of a faithful, righteous person as someone who is morally good, someone who is pure, at least according to most religious definitions. Righteousness as promoted by religion is usually defined in the negative about avoiding what religion or culture thinks is wrong or immoral or sinful. In fact, defining what is righteous and unrighteous and then enforcing a code, a code of moral purity is pretty much the definition of religion today. At least it's a definition of fundamentalism. And in my personal experience, whenever fundamentalists acquire political power, the first thing they do is try to enforce a strict moral code on everyone else and then justify it as an act of being faithful to what they believe. The word for that in politics is hogwash. That's about coercive power, not faith. And that's why it comes sometimes as a shock to our righteous Christian politicians to discover that in the Bible, faith is not about moral purity. Not at all. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just read the Bible. Read the stories of the faithful. The stories of Abram and Noah and David and Solomon. The stories of Peter and James and John and Paul. And if you do, you will discover that these people were not righteous at all by the standards of their religions. They were not paragons of moral purity. They were cowards and cads and colluders and cheats and liars. And one more thing, every one of them was called by a God who called them to walk into an uncertain future, put one foot in front of the other and go from where they were to where God was calling them to be. It comes as kind of a shock to us to be reminded that at the very beginning of the Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition, there is this radically unreligious affirmation about faith. Faith is not defined by a person's morality, but by a person's response to God's call. The call to become something new. The call to venture forth into uncharted territory. The call to walk into a future with nothing more than a promise before you. And it's frankly breathtaking to note that the heart of our faith is this notion that righteousness is not about moral purity or theological aptitude, but is a risky responsiveness to God's call to leave certainty behind and walk into an unforeseen future. The story and its message comes to us, we Lutherans, at a critical and difficult moment in our existence. Our four congregations are part of nearly 10,000 that constitute the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, a denomination of more than 3.5 million people. About 8,000 of our congregations currently can afford a full-time pastor. We've been in the news lately because of a recent study that was delivered to our seminaries that indicates that by the year 2021, and that's not on the far side of the moon, that's four years from today, 
the number of vacancies amongst those 8,000 congregations will conservatively number 2,000. If you add those to the ones that already can't afford it, that means that four years from today, 40% of all Lutheran congregations will not have a full-time called pastor. You want to know why? It ain't about money. It's about availability. It's about call. Here's the truth. We cannot sustain our old assumptions. We cannot do it. We can't continue to act out of our old values. We, all of us here today, are being called into a new and uncharted future, unencumbered by old traditions and old expectations. We, right here, are being called to a new place and a new time and a new land and a new way of thinking. And the choice that we have is to stay where we are and die or to go forth and live. And by the way, it's the main reason we walk together in this thing we call LSIM. We're taking a bit of a breather. But the call for us is clear, even if the future is not. One thing you can be sure of, however, is that when you walk into God's future, there is nothing you can be sure of but this. The one who calls you is faithful. The one that calls you is righteous. And God calls you to let go of old certainties, to ignore old truths. He calls us to be faithful to new possibilities. I believe God is calling us to let go and move ahead. This is what the story of Abram and Sarai is all about. And coincidentally, it is the essence of that other familiar story you heard today about a man who came to see Jesus at night whose name was Nicodemus. He too was settled in his ways, a Pharisee, a religious official who knew and zealously kept the law. He studied it, discussed it, interpreted it, applied it. He lived his religion every minute of every day as defined by the law and the rules and the regulations of his religion. He goes to see the young rabbi from Nazareth at night because he didn't want to be seen seeing him in the middle of the day. And they talk. And it's a tortured, convoluted conversation by any measure. Rabbi, he says, we, we, speaking for all of his other rabbis, we know you are a man of God. We know you come from God. And Jesus says to him, and I know that you must be born anew. And Nicodemus, settled, stable, past the age you change your mind and think new thoughts or seek new truths, says to Jesus, but how do you do that? How can you be born anew? How can you enter your mother's womb a second time? The world's first fundamentalist. He can't see the theological forest for the trees. Nicodemus, like Abram, this is about newness, about letting go of old truths, old definition, old traditions, old assumptions about allowing God to lead him into a new, open-ended, hope-filled future. And it was right there in that story, in the middle of the night in the streets of Jerusalem, that perhaps the most important theological statement was ever made. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And everyone who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loves the world. He loves the world so much. The world where you live. And where I live, where each and every day we struggle to go from point A to point B, that world is the one that God loves. Can we love it any less? He loves it so much, he radically re redefines himself in that world in a new way. Not in terms of power or judgment or punishment, not in any of the ways we expect. But in terms of love. He comes to us. In the common, ordinary, mundane warp and the wolf of life. He comes to us in the bread and the wine. He comes to us in the water and the word. He comes to us when two or three of us gather in this place. To bless us with his presence and to call us forth into a new future. That is who calls us. That is the one who has the ability to overcome what's in here and in here. The God who loves us. It's not a God who waits in holy splendor for us to prostrate ourselves and beg for his mercy. It's not a God who demands that we devote our lives to being pure, to warn his attention. This God loves the world so much he holds nothing back from it, not even his son. And this is something we'll never be able to understand, never be able to explain. It is, as Luther taught us, something you have to worship. The truth about Abram and Sarah, the truth about Nicodemus, the truth about you and I is that we are the ones that God loves. We are the ones that God invites to stand up and walk bravely into that new world and hold our heads high because we are the ones who are called children of God. And this love from the heart of God that's been given without condition, it lays down its life asking only this, that we accept it, we receive it, we let it come into our lives and change us, rebirth us. 
that we trust the one who gives it with our lives and our futures. This love calls us like Abraham, calls us like Nicodemus, regardless of our age, regardless of our moral purity, to let go, to walk ahead, and to be born anew. To God be the glory. Amen.